Hi everybody, I'm Marion Todd. I'm the author of the DI Claire Mackay crime series, which are police procedural books set in St Andrews in Fife in Scotland. Um, there are three books published at the moment and um, have a contract for another three. And I've just finished writing book four. I'm waiting for the edits on that and starting to think about book five. So it's all go. Um, yeah, that's, so that's me. That's exciting that there's going to be another three. Yes, yeah. I'm sort of thinking, oh, you know, where's all that coming from? Because when I, I got my contract, I'd already written the first two and I had an idea for the third. So it was, um, it didn't seem too difficult. And then I was offered another three in a contract and I thought, yeah, there's lots more I want to do with this series. And book four is, you know, that's fine. And I've got some ideas for book five. I actually have lots of ideas. It's it's kind of bringing them all together and making them into kind of um, what, will, what will hopefully make a, an engaging book that's that's the challenge. But um, so that's, well, that's what we're all trying to do. Claire's like a really great character. Oh, God, I like her. Yeah, she's brilliant. What inspired her? Um, you know, I, I, I think she sort of looks like an actress that I saw on TV many, many years ago, whose name I've forgotten. And that sort of always stuck in my head. But I think I've just made her all the things I would really like to be. And I'm not really. Um, so she's a bit taller than me. She's very fit. And although she does, you know, make her mistakes and, and so on, she's actually quite a together, organised person. Um, and I, because I've, I've, I've known quite a few police officers over the years, I know that they're, they're definitely not perfect, but they're, my, by and large, all incredibly hardworking and dedicated and really want to do a good job. And I wanted to create someone like that. I've given her her flaws, but I didn't really want to make her a hard-bitten, kind of um, snappy, drinking, kind of um, difficult person to be with. I wanted her to be what most people in the police are, reasonable and hardworking and, and just trying to do a good job. Um, I think she's grown with each book. I've, I've come to know her a bit better. And sometimes she'll do something that, that I think, oh, Claire, I didn't know you were going to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm actually enjoying getting to know her as well. How, so you were nominated for the um, debut prize at Bloody Scotland this year? That was such a thrill. I know, and shortlisted. How did that feel? Oh, I mean, just absolutely amazing. Um, I saw I had a missed call from um, one of the uh, organisers of Bloody Scotland and I thought, ooh, because I knew that the list was coming out, but, you know, I just thought it could be anything really. And um, and then when he said that I was on the short list, I just, I thought, this, you know, all my birthdays have come at once. It really was a dream come true. Um, I've been to Bloody Scotland many times in the past and sort of about probably five years ago, something like that, I went to their crime writing workshop to try and learn what makes a good crime novel. And I, I sort of thought, because you always do think, I wonder if I could you know, be part of Bloody Scotland one year. But you kind of think to yourself, don't be stupid. You know, there's, there's so many people writing and there's so few people make it to, to that kind of level. Um, and so to be chosen by the organisers and, and the people who were reading the, the potential books as one of the four, I, I just thought, you know, this, this is, I can't ask for anything better. Even if I, you know, don't win, which, which it, it went to a wonderful book by Deborah Masson, but, you know, even if I didn't win, I'll always be able to say I was one of the four shortlisted books and, and that's just been the best thing ever. So exciting. If nothing ever good, if nothing good ever happened again <laughs> in the writing, I'll, I'll always have that. So that was a great thrill. You collaborated on a story as well, didn't you, with um, Gordon and... Yes, that was that was like organised chaos. It was actually great fun. Um, we had a, it, so, so when I say there's four of us, there was actually five. 
um, the writer Gordon Brown, who now goes by the pen name Morgan Cry, um, is one of the Bloody Scotland organisers. And Gordon took on the thankless task of kind of whipping us into shape and saying, right, you know, let's organise this story. And he also agreed to write a thousand words of the story as well. So we were to do a thousand words each. So we had a Zoom meeting and had a chat about it and floated about some ideas about what we thought the story could be about. And there, there were only really two things that we had to do. We had to in some way mention or include the sponsor, who were Glen Cairn Glass, because they were very kindly sponsoring the prize. And it had to be a crime story. So, you know, we played about with ideas and then um, I drew the short straw. Well, actually, I say the short straw. I think it was quite lucky, actually. I was the first to write my thousand words. And then it was like a kind of chain game. I passed it to Deborah and then Deborah passed it to Francine Toon. Francine passed it to Stephen O'Rourke and Stephen finally passed it to Gordon who put the, the kind of finishing touch. And then it was, it, it, that was quite interesting because when I started my thousand words, I kind of thought, right, I think I can imagine what might happen next. This is what I would do if it was my story. But then you have to stop and hand it across. And every time it went to someone else, there was something that made me think, that's why these guys are shortlisted. They're so good. It was, so, it was such fun to see what, what was done with the story. And then we were all um, asked to read it and have a think about it. And then we got together again and we started talking about tidying it up and doing some editing. And it, it sort of went back and forward like a boomerang for um, a, a few weeks, probably. Maybe, maybe not as much as that, maybe a couple of weeks. And then finally it went to a copy editor and then we were sent the sort of proof copy and uh, someone did us a beautiful, stunning cover photo, which is really dark and moody, with kind of whiskey glasses and things. And um, the, then we heard it was going to be on the Sunday Post and it's now in the Sunday Post rather, which is a... a Scottish newspaper, very popular. It's got the Bruins and Ur Willie in it every week. So if anybody's a fan of those, that's the Sunday Post. And then we were told that it um, would be in a podcast as well, which has yet to come out. But we've all recorded um, not entirely our own thousand words, because what did happen was the story was chopped about a bit. There were some different time frames. It was the past, the present and the future. And it kind of jumped around a little bit. So I ended up reading part of my bit and part of Stephen's bit. Um, and then it was, I haven't heard the other recordings yet. I just sent mine off. And so that's something else to look forward to. Um, so it, it carries on, even though Bloody Scotland itself is finished. The story is still out there. Um, it's available online now through the Bloody Scotland website and also through Glen Cairn. And the podcast should be coming out quite soon, I think. I'll be shouting about it on Facebook when it does. Brilliant. Yeah. Make sure to link all the podcast things into the group as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, I will do. I will, if that's okay, yes, I'm quite happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fab. So back to your books and Claire, what gives you the ideas? Because the first one opens with quite an intriguingly different story. Yes, yeah. Okay. Well, um, in general, ideas come from anywhere. You know, I'll quite often watch um, things like um, sort of Crime Watch and programs like that to, to see what's kind of happening. And that gives me some insight into investigation techniques and reconstructions and things like that. And whenever I see something that I think, oh, I could do something with that, I tap it a note on my phone and I transfer that to a, a Word document on the computer which is now nine pages long. Um, there might be some repetition, I'm not really quite sure, but I've got some sections for settings and uh, crimes and criminals and victims and things like that. So I've got a huge document of ideas that I can draw on. But book three itself, um, I wanted to put Claire in a really difficult position. I wanted to make life very difficult for her. And without giving away any spoilers in case anybody hasn't read it and would like to, um, Claire is told quite early on in the book that 
there's a leak in Police Scotland and it's under investigation and that she's just to carry on as normal and she's, she's got kind of other crimes to investigate when this is going on. There's a student who's disappeared and she's also been given a, a witness to protect um, a witness who's in kind of secret location for a trial. Um, so all of that's going on and then um, the, uh, what happens next? Yeah, she's told that she can't tell anybody in her team what's going on. Um, that there is this, uh, this, this leak in Police Scotland. So she has to go back to her station and behave as if nothing's happened and um, not tell her colleagues that, that uh, there's a leak. And in the meantime, the person who's investigating the leak comes to work out of St Andrews because this person thinks that they'll slip under the radar there because it's quite a small station. So it's really putting Claire in a very tricky position. And I wanted to do that just to, to kind of mess things about so that she, there were things that she wouldn't even be able to tell her, her detective sergeant, Chris, um, and just see what, what came out of that. So it was quite fun to do. Um, poor Claire. The end of book three just made me like it's so sad. In I'm, part. Really, I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay. But like in a nice way though, it's like heartwarming and sad. What I would say is um there's obviously there's a bit of a a dilemma at the end of book three and it is resolved in book four. My editor said to me, Stop mucking about, make a decision and sort out book four. So <laughs> I done that. Um but yes, yes, I had, had a lot of fun with the, the kind of um, the, the sort of final kind of climactic scene in book three. I really enjoyed that. The story develops for Claire and her family over the, the course of the three books so far. Do you have in mind like an ending for the series? Oh, that's a very good question. I don't know because I think I probably only think one or at the most two books ahead at a time. So I know what's obviously I've just written book four, and um, there's a bit of Claire's private life in that. Maybe not not as much as in book three or in book one. Um, book five, I I'm I'm going to mess about with her private life a little bit again. And I can't really see beyond that. Um, I sort of think at some point in the future, we should have a baby. And I'll, I'll kind of start the book up when she's coming back after maternity leave. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. But I think I'll know. In the same way that if, you're, if you kind of <laughs> think you're having a baby, you know when it's, when it's the right time for you. I think I'll know when it's the right time for Claire, if ever. Um, I don't really want to retire her. I don't want to to kind of kill her off or do anything that might make her leave the police, I don't think. But I don't know. Um, we'll see. So Martin Lee says that your planning is legendary for books. I do like to plan. I like a good plan. Um, I, I should have done a printout, actually. What, what I tend to do is, I, I obviously, I know where I'm going. I know where the, what the finish is going to be. Some people don't. I believe... I heard Ian Rankin say on one occasion that sometimes he doesn't even know who the killer is. And I think that just sends me into a kind of flap. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Um, probably when I wrote the first book, I, I wasn't planning quite so much. But once you have a contract, your editor will say to you, I'd like an outline for the next book quite soon. Because what they want to do is to, first of all, see if, if it's acceptable, if they're happy with it. And then secondly, they want to um, be able to put the book up on pre-sale, which generates a bit of interest. And there needs to be a blurb to go with that. So I'm having to plan really, but I, I like planning because it, it just makes the writing process a lot easier. That's not to say that I don't deviate and go off when something occurs to me as I write. But I like to know pretty much what's happening every day of, of the, the police investigation. So what I do is um, open up PowerPoint and I create a slide for every scene. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really micro planning here. 
Um, <clears throat> and at the top of the slide, I'll put the day and the date because I like to sort of have things paced out. I usually, because I usually know how things are going to end, I'll know what, which day of the week it's going to end on. Sometimes that's important. Um, for example, the book I've just written ends on a, with a party and that has to be a Saturday night because that, that's when most parties tend to be. Um, obviously they're not in lockdown, but um, so I kind of work back from that. So at the top of every slide, there's a day and date and below that, there's a couple of sentences as to what happens in that scene. And the reason I do this is because I write wholly from Claire's point of view. You never, apart from maybe a prologue at the beginning or something like that, you never see the story from the murderer's point of view or any anything like that. It's completely what Claire knows. So I will know that something has happened. Um, for example, someone's been killed on a Thursday, but Claire may not find that out until Friday. But I need to know that it's happened on Thursday because if there's then subsequently a post-mortem or I'm talking about whether the body has, has rigor mortis or that kind of thing, I need to know how long the body's been dead. So I'll create a slide for things that have happened that Claire doesn't know about and put that in the right order, but I'll colour code that so that I know that that's not to be written about at that stage, but I can refer back to it. And I'll, I'll find when I'm doing this, and it takes a good month to do this, I'll find that things might be in the wrong order. So I can drag the slides around. And once I've got this in the right order and I'm champing at the bit to get writing, I'll do an export into a Word document and um, just kind of reduce the font. And that sits at the bottom of my first draft as my plan. And as I write each scene, I delete it. Um, so the plan gets shorter and shorter and shorter as I get through the book. And that's a lovely feeling. And it also means I don't have to think what comes next. That doesn't mean that I don't change. I'm not regimented and, it, and things do change, but the basic bones of it um, remain as is. Um, so I, I can sometimes spend almost as long doing the planning as I do with the actual writing. Because once you plan to that extent, the writing's easy, um, mostly. Uh, one or two things can stick you, but uh, you know, so the planning is, is a very important thing for me. I know people hold up their hands in horror and say, how can you do that? But it, um, it makes me happy. <laughs> it means I sleep at night, you know, I don't go to bed thinking, how am I gonna resolve this? Um, so, yes. Sam has a question for you on the stream. She says, do you have a favourite story from your time as a hotel lounge pianist? Oh my gosh, goodness. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there, there's quite a lot. I, I worked, for anyone who doesn't know, I worked as a, a pianist in a hotel sort of um, cocktail bar, quite quite a nice, nice hotel lounge. And... Um, I played on Fridays and Saturday nights, um, usually from about seven to 10, but I could play on longer if there was there was a, a function or, or something like that. And I could pretty much please myself uh, what I played and I had a kind of notebook of, of things and sometimes people would come up and ask for requests. And that's usually fine because I can play by ear. So if as long as I know something, I can usually bash out a version of it on the, the piano. But one night this this um, lady came up, a very nice lady, and she said, I wonder if you could play me something from my favourite musical. And I thought, oh, musicals, I like musicals. I said, yes, of course, what would you like? She says, it's Phantom of the Opera. And I thought, oh, I don't really know all the songs from that. So she told me what the song was, and I think it was Music of the Night or something like that. I thought, yeah, yeah, I know that. So I started off playing it. I thought, this is great. She went to be down and she was sitting listening. And about halfway through, I realised I'm not playing music of the night anymore. I don't actually know what I am playing, but I've started to play a completely different tune. I had started and I must have reached the middle bit and then gone off in the wrong direction. I mean, I've got um, previous convictions for that. I, I did it at a Christmas carol service where I, I thought, no, I don't need the music. I'll, you know, I, um, I think it was... 
once in Royal David City and I played the music to Heart the Herald. Angels singing or something like that. So we <laughs> always use the music, folks. Um, so that was a bit of a, a, a daft thing to do. Um, she was very polite and she said, thank you very much. And I just sort of hoped that maybe she would think it was the long playing version of it or something. Um, there used to be quite a lot of fun as well when there was a wedding on because although the weddings would take place in function rooms, there would be a, a, a time usually between about seven o'clock and eight o'clock when the wedding party would drift out into the bar for a few drinks while the function suite was being set up for dancing and the band would be coming in carrying their amps and their guitars and everything like that and the place would be buzzing and it would just I mean for people watching it was it was gold absolute gold the, the things that I have stored away the characters that I have pinched from weddings because usually by that stage people are drunk and loud and um, started to misbehave and the thing about weddings is that it's two families coming together and the bride and groom may love each other but sometimes the two families don't and they're quite different so there, there's a lot of interest there it's um lots of people giving out advice and um talking too loudly so yeah um it was it was entertaining stuff I'm not sure i'd like to go back and do it now because it's hard work but uh, it was good fun at the time was any of that the inspiration for the hotel in book one yes yes <laughs> That wedding, um, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, I don't see the wedding, uh, Kaylee, as there is a book one, um, see them run, which I have here. Oops. That way. <laughs> yeah, got it. See them run opens with a wedding, a wedding Kaylee, which, if anybody doesn't know what a Kaylee is, it's a Scottish country dance, and it's usually, um, it doesn't have to be a wedding, but weddings in Scotland often do have a Cayley and by this stage it's well into the evening people have been drinking champagne all day and wine with the meal and um, brandies and things so they're all trolleyed and this the dancing gets wilder and wilder and um, I usually come home with bruises after a wedding Cayley it's that wild and I, I wanted very much to open a book or to include a wedding Kaylee in one of the books because it's just such a rich seam of human behaviour. And um, as I was writing it, I could see the characters. I could see the drunk wife getting up, um, firing her shoes across the floor because she you know, couldn't dance in her heels and um, somebody else falling on their backside and things like that. I could see it all because I've been to many, many of them. They're great fun. So, yeah, nothing's wasted. Excellent. Uh, Sam also says she used to love reading Family Circle. What genre was your short story for them? It was a children's short story. Um, gosh, that's that's how, how great to hear um, from another Family Circle fan. That, that, that tip shows you how old you are. Um, it was a short story competition for children, and... Um, I came up with this story about, it was called The House with the Mind of Its Own. And it was about this, this boy lived in this house, and, but the house was, was um, a bit anarchic and it used to mess things about and he would, he would go away to his work and he would come home and he would never quite know what the house was going to do. And um, it would swap rooms around, he would open the door and find it, it was in the bathroom and all the rest of it. It would switch the washing machine on and things like that and just, just kind of have a laugh. And I like the idea of, of doing silly things like that. And then um, his very kind of loud, um, very overbearing aunt from Australia comes to stay. And this drives the house crazy. So he and the house have to hatch a plan to get rid of her. And that's what the story was about. That's a long time ago. <laughs> you ever try, attempted to write for children now or...? I, not now, I did when I was younger um, and it's a very, very difficult market to break into and I think these days you probably need an illustrator in tow. Now I think I'm too far away from what children are doing because my, my children are grown up, they're all the sort of 20s and 30s. Um, I think I probably don't know enough about kind of children's culture to write in a way that would be 
well received. I wouldn't say no, though. I'd quite like to. Um, so never say never. But I'd have to do some research. I think I'd have to to go and be that that um, strange adult that hangs about in children's bookshops and, and kind of see what the children are picking up and um, and reading. Um, so maybe one day, maybe. So thinking about you saying if you write children's books now, you might need an illustrator. One of my favourite questions to ask at Author Chats is, would you make a graphic novel of one of your books? I think that would actually be quite a fun thing to do. Um, I'm just not sure how the process works, but yeah, I'm open to anything at all. Um, the only thing I wonder about is, I, I, I quite often, I think as I've, I've written more and more books, they're becoming more multi-layered. At least I hope they are. That's what I'm trying to do. And I'm not sure how that would work in a graphic novel. What I might want to do is to take a short story. I quite like writing short stories um, and perhaps see how that would work. Or, you know, that probably wouldn't be long enough, but maybe write a novella um, or I'll come up with the idea. But um, it's not something that at the moment I think I know enough about, but open to open to suggestions, definitely. Um, cool. Yeah. It's, they're very popular now. There's whole kind of stands and bookshops for them. I think um, Ian Rankin has written some and, and other people as well. can't think who they are. You probably know better than me, Kaz. Yeah, I'm a bit of a... I'm a bit of a nerd. That's why I always ask that question. Right, that's my homework. Then I'm going to going to start <laughs> just to see how. So, so if could you take a, a book as long as say See Them Run and put that into a graphic novel? Would that work? Yeah, I think so. There's been adaptations of quite long right. novels. I'm going to have a look at that next time I'm in a bookshop. Thank you. <laughs> so we've had Sheila Bugler on. She's asked about your uh, protagonist and writing process, which I know we've touched on. Uh -huh. Do you have a favourite relationship that you've created? Well, I mean, obviously, Claire and Benji. That is the best, definitely. Um, relationship. Um, I quite like I quite like Claire and Chris together. Um, there's no romantic interest there, so I don't really have to think about how it's developing, but Chris is quite quite sort of different um from claire in that he's he's a bit lazy um maybe not very subtle um and i quite like how they rub off each other sometimes i give chris the the sort of the inspiration you know you know i'll let him discover something rather than claire a bit like um lewis discovering something that morse has overlooked like I always rooted for Lewis. I always wanted Lewis to. I thought Morse was horrible to him sometimes. I love Morse, and I love the, the TV adaptations. But the way he speaks to Lewis sometimes is quite horrible. Um, but I do like kind of an interplay between Claire and Chris. Um, but I guess in book four. Oh, I better not say this. Mm, mm, will I give something away? I don't know. In book four, I've sent Benji to dog training because he's turning into a bit of a thug. But I'm not sure if that's going to make the cut. I'm waiting on the edits just now, so we'll see what comes back. But I'm going to try and slip it in somehow. Um, I do I do like Benji very much. He's, he's the dog I would like to have instead of the thug dog that I do have. He was <laughs> adorable and he's wonderful, but he, he's just... I think that's why I've made Benji a bit badly behaved, so that it's not just me. So we've got a couple more comments coming in. Francesca Riccardi thinks she should read Preacher. Preacher? So great, Preacher. Yeah, she, Preacher. They're a great series of graphic novels. They are actually really good. Oh, graphic novels. All oh, right. Thank, yeah. thank you. Right. OK. All right. I'll note that down. They're a good series. Uh, yeah. Right. I recommend them. Good. Thank uh, you for that. Eileen Brown says she's not read any of your books. What would you suggest that you read? She reads first. I would definitely, yeah. definitely start with See Them Run. Um, oops, you know you can tell I'm not very good with cameras because I always go the wrong way. Here we go. There it is. Um, See Them Run is the first book in the series, and 
you learn Claire's backstory um, and, and why she's come to St Andrews because she did she was in Glasgow and quite you know worked quite well in Glasgow but there's something in her past that meant that she wanted to have a complete change and that's revealed as the book um, goes on so I would definitely start with See Them Run. Um, the second one is In Plain Sight hold on put it in the wrong direction again that's in plain sight and that takes that opens on the beach in St Andrews the West Sands and the third one is Lies to Tell which is the one we were talking about a minute ago with um, Claire having been told that there's a leak within Police Scotland and they are best read in order because the story is kind of well, built. I said that I do. I am conscious that people could pick up any book and start with any number. So I do try to make sure that they can be read without having to read the previous ones by just dripping in enough information that that um, people can you know know what's going on without being hopefully without being too repetitive. So the location is. I feel like an extra star in the novels. Have you ever been tempted to have some like photographs of places that you've used and things so people can yes. go on a tour? Yeah. yeah, funnily enough, someone was talking to me about that on Twitter the other day. I, I way back at the beginning when I was um, chatting to my agent before I signed, I mentioned that I would love to do a photo tour and she thought that was a great idea. Um, it's just a case of getting time. I planned to do it this year and then lockdown happened. And because I don't live in St Andrews, I live about 11 miles away. I didn't feel I could go to the town because we were only meant to go, I think, to sort of five miles for shopping or something like that. So I thought, well, I can't go to St Andrews. It's not fair. Um, and then I got very, very busy writing book four. And then I submitted book four just a few weeks ago and and, and there's been such a lot of happening since then with Bloody Scotland and I was away for a bit as well. So I haven't had time to do it, but definitely I would love to do a kind of photo tour um, of the places that do exist. I make places up um, so that, you know, I, I'm wary of setting a murder in someone's house or something like that. Um, so the hotel in book one is a made up hotel and I'm just about to start thinking about book five where I think I'm going to create something that doesn't exist as well. But, you know, St Andrews, the West Sands and, and um, places where Claire will be walking along South Streets, we've got some beautiful buildings. So yes, yes, it, it definitely needs to happen. Um, when I get that elusive five minutes to nip, nip through and take some photos. Sam asks, have you always lived in Scotland? Yes, I you know, I've been really boring, Sam. Um, I was born in Dundee, which is about four and a half miles away from where I am now. And then I'm, I moved across to, I lived in St Andrews for a year, and then I moved across um, back to Dundee and then back across to Fife again. Um, and I, I, I live in a, a village, it's quite a big village, but it's lovely. And I'm now in my third house because it's such a lovely place to live. Um, great views across the River Tay. And I just, you know, I, it's a lovely, lovely place. So I don't don't see me moving anywhere else unless something happens. Yes, I'm very boring, sorry. It's all right. It's fine to live in what, if you live somewhere as beautiful as Scotland, you probably would like to stay in one place. Yeah, I mean, there's lovely places I'd like to live. Um, I'm just back from a week in Skye, and that's just stunning, the Isle of Skye off the west coast of Scotland. I think it's one of the Inner Hebrides. It's an utterly amazing um, island. It's, it's got kind of really jagged black hills and wonderful kind of rolling um, green hills as well, and, and these kind of great stacks of, of just kind of, just kind of well, one of them's called the Old Man of Store. If you haven't heard of that, look it up. Um, I went up to the Old Man of Store, didn't climb it because it's, it's just like straight up. But um, it, it's just an amazing place to live. So there's lots of places. Some of the bigger cities are, are great fun. Glasgow's fabulous. I love Glasgow. 
um, Edinburgh as well. There's, there's lovely, lovely places to live in Scotland, but you've got to be somewhere, haven't you? You can't keep shifting around. So Sam says you've told us about some of your memorable moments so far, but do you have a favourite memorable moment as an author? Um, from when I was working in a bar, at the, the bar pianist, or just generally favourite memories? No, your, your favourite memorable moment as an author. Oh, as an author, right. Uh, well, it would be pretty hard to beat being shortlisted for Bloody Scotland. That was a huge thrill. But the, the one that sticks in my head, and I will never forget it, was um, in December 2018. It was a Saturday night, and I was sitting with my feet up watching telly, and my, there was a sound from my phone. And I saw that it was a, an email from uh, my agent, who wasn't my agent at this time. I'd sent off See Them Run, and was just waiting on a pile of rejections, really. And this was an email that started, um, hello, Marion, you know, thank you very much for sending this. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. And then what always comes next is, but it's not really right for our list at this time, or, or but we feel that something blah, 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 blah. And I was just so jaded and thinking, here we'll go again. And there wasn't a but. And it said, um, could you please send me the, the full manuscript? And I thought, okay, that's really exciting. But I've had a few, uh, they're called full requests before, where I've, I've sent off a synopsis in three chapters and then they'll come back to you and they'll say, actually, I'd like to see the whole thing. And then inevitably, a few weeks later, they'll come back and say, really enjoyed it, but. So I sent it off and then Christmas came and New Year came. And again, another Saturday night, sitting with the feet up on the city watching telly. And um, it was... Hi, Marion, you know, thank you so much for sending it. Sorry it's taken me a while to get back to you. I really enjoyed reading it, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Where's the but? And it was, and I'd like to call you next week. And I <laughs> thought, oh, that's really, really exciting. And I, I, I think I remember that moment until my dying day because I just suddenly thought, this is, this is real. This is somebody who now wants to talk to me about signing me. And, and she, she also said, I want to speak to my, some of my colleagues um, as well, not because she wanted them to agree, but because she was thinking of other opportunities for the books as well. And I, I thought, you know, I think, I think I'm going to be sick. I'm so excited. Uh, so that's pretty memorable. I think those two moments being told that I had an agent interested, more than interested, and being shortlisted for the Bloody Scotland Prize. They're, they're the best things that have happened. So lucky, so so fabulously lucky, because there's lots and lots of very gifted, very talented writers trying to just find a way in. And sometimes it's just that they haven't met the agent who wants that kind of book. Um, it, you have to be lucky. And uh, I've written some really good books. Sorry, say that again? I said, and to have written some really good well, books. I suppose it helps. It helps if you've got <laughs> something decent. But uh, don't underestimate the, the power of a good editor um, because they're just, they, they can, they don't write the books for you. They don't, they don't change anything. But they'll say to you, you need to do more of this. And that scene requires a bit of something else. And I would take that out. I would, I would find some, another way to say this. And then they spot the things that, um, I, th I hope I'm getting better at, but the things that you use again and again and again, um, you know, there's a lot of chin stroking, <laughs> or beard stroking and smiling and laughing and, and nodding. And my, my um, characters are, must sound like the village idiot. They're just nodding, nodding all the time, mm -hmm. nodding and smiling. Um, so they're very good at spotting these kinds of things as well. Um, so it is teamwork. Uh, Eileen Brown says, are there any authors who have inspired you? Definitely, yeah. Um, I, in terms of crime writers, then I, I don't think you can beat Ian Rankin. His books are just so well written and, and always seem to wrong foot me. I never seem to guess what's going on. For sheer readability and just, just lovely, lovely drawing you in, I would say Anne Cleves. 
I think she's possibly becoming my favourite author. But the book that really made me think I wanted to write crime was um, by Kate Atkinson. And it was one of her Jackson Brodie novels set in Edinburgh called One Good Turn. And although I haven't written a book with multiple points of view as she has done in that book, it made me think, you know, crime fiction really can be amazing and wonderful. And that's the book that that I decided, right, I'm going to write a crime novel and see how it turns out. Um, but there's so many others. I mean, it just, I, my Kindle is full because I keep thinking, well, I must read this, I must read that. Um, there's so many wonderful authors out there. But I would say Ian Rankin, Anne Cleves and Kate Atkinson would be my top three. There's quite an appetite for Scottish crime and yeah. crime TV. Has there been any interest in developing your series? Um, yes and, and no. Um, there's been some initial interest, but nothing that, that's come to, to anything yet. Um, I, I see that uh, Val McDermott wrote a novel set in St Andrews, and that's been uh, commissioned for TV. And that's going to be filmed. Um, so that might awaken interest in... in uh, in the town, who knows? Um, but if you're out there, producers, I'm open to offers. <laughs> uh, there's another question from Sam here. She says, "How do you find the promotion side? Yeah. How do you find the promotion side of writing, especially social media? Because you're very active with it." Yes, I know. It's do you know it's great avoidance activity when you should be writing and you think. Oh, <laughs> Uh, the only one I find quite difficult is Instagram because it's it's not I'm not a very good photographer. I take photos with my phone and they're fine. And but I always forget, you know, sometimes if I eat something really nice for my tea, I think I should have photographed that and put it on Instagram. <laughs> but um, you know, I do my best. I quite like the the marketing side of it, but it is incredibly time consuming. Um, Twitter, I think, is very supportive and it's almost more about um, being with your your tribe it's also about engaging with readers and that's wonderful it's so lovely to to kind of have feedback on twitter um, from readers but there's also a lot of author support there as well um, and that that's hugely useful um, but i do I, I quite like the marketing side of it as well um because it's it's different it gives you a change from writing and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to promote yourself to, to kind of say why my book is amazing because in the back of your head there's the little voice going no it's not no it's, it's not right I don't know. um but it, you know it, it's it's hopefully i'm getting better at it i think it's a very scottish thing to not big yourself up to kind of just say, you know, someone says, I liked your book, oh, well, it's not that good, you know, don't know, no, it's okay. Um, but I'm, I'm trying. They are very good. Well, you're very kind, thank you, thank you. I can't, I can't take them, sorry, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Um, she also says, is it difficult to balance dripping bits from previous books into the new books without giving anything away? You know, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's really, really obvious to me what's going on because I know it and because I've planned it. Sometimes something does happen that's unexpected and that's great because you think, well, if I didn't know it, hopefully the reader won't know. I, I find it ha the hardest thing of all is concealing what I know and trying without being unfair to wrong foot the reader. Um, when someone says to me, I didn't see that coming, then I'm always really pleased. But then sometimes other people will say, yeah, I kind of knew what was happening. I knew what was going on. And I think, well, yeah, I'm not surprised because I knew it. So I think that is the hardest thing. And I never really know if I've pulled it off until I see the reviews. Um, because obviously my editor would tell me, but but they're, they've seen the outline, so they know what's happening as well, what's, what's coming up. Um, so I'm very, very open to 
people telling me that they knew things because only if I realize that can I learn from it and try to craft a, a, a better plot the next time. Um, so if people, you know, negative feedback is hurts, but it's just as useful and probably more valuable than, than the positive feedback. If you get too much of that, then you start believing your own press. Um, it's good to know what people think is wrong with your book up to a point. Some reviews can be quite hurtful, but you just have to take that on the chin and just say, oh, well, can't please everybody. Um, but I, I don't know. What do you think, Kaz? Do you think, do you find it easy to read a crime book and work out what's going on or are you often wrong-footed? I am um, often wrong-footed, which is probably surprising because I read a lot of crime books. Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah. I think if anybody would know, you would. Did you? Oh, so here's a question without giving anything away for anybody who hasn't read it. Did you know what was going on in book three? Lies to tell. No, I did not guess that. Did, did you not know what was going to happen? Um, right, okay, that's 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 really nice to know because I, I sort of, I found that very difficult to do. Um, and I, I wasn't sure if I had managed to pull that off. I thought people are going to guess before they get to this scene. Got, got anybody who hasn't read it now, you absolutely have to read it because you wonder what on earth we're talking about. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, I, I never, I very rarely ever get a, a twist. I never do. I'm hopeless. <laughs> Malcolm Hollingbrake, you've touched on this. He He's one of our author members and he says, oh. how do you deal with negative reviews? Oh, gosh, it, it just hurts so much. Um, I mean, it happens, you know, you've got to, um, I think the first time I, I had one, I was absolutely, I, I was like a knife in my heart. Um, so I, 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 I tend to look at them now and think, okay, and I might be a little bit sort of down in the dumps, but I only allow myself to be down in the dumps that day. The next morning I get up, it's a new day. And the reviews in the past and you know big girl pants on or big boy pants on and um i just move on and i i i look at the good ones and um i think well you know i'm pleasing most people um and you really can't you know when i think of the books that i read um i in my head i don't leave bad reviews i, I if i really didn't like a book i don't leave a review at all because i know what how much it hurts to get a bad review um there is there's there's I don't read them a second time that's the other thing there, there was one that was really insultingly hurtful and I thought you know there's no need to say things like that but that says more about the reviewer than it does about me I hope and I just move on but but it, it does hurt I'm, I'm not gonna ever I don't think it ever won't hurt but I spoke to a couple of actors that I know really well, and I said, how do you deal with bad reviews? And they said, I don't read them. So, you know, just don't read them. Um, and they also said, if people tag you in them, remove the tag or ask them to remove the tag. Um, because it's one thing if they want to uh, give a, a negative review, but if, if they tag you in it, then everybody who follows you will see that, and that's potentially damaging. So... Um, I, I find that there's there some websites, some review sites are more scathing than others. And if you write, you'll know the one I'm talking about. Um, and we all sort of just think you go and you look through your fingers and just hope that there's not going to be anything too, too yeah. awful. But you can't, you can't please everybody. So just, you know, move on. Uh, there's a question here that says, do you write reviews for books that you read? I do. I, I always try to. Um, there, there have been a few books that I've read when I thought, I can think of one book that I read that I really didn't like at all. I felt it was too long. It was well over 500 pages. And I know um, that lots of writers, uh, authors have books as long and longer than that. 
but um, I felt that it was overwritten. I, I didn't feel engaged with it and it wasn't my kind of thing. So I decided not to leave a review for that because I didn't want to hurt the author. And clearly the book has been published and it had other positive reviews. So it just obviously wasn't my thing. But if I've enjoyed a book, I will always leave a review because um, I know as an author, how much you look to see what someone said. And, and it also helps hugely if you have a high number of reviews. I think it, it means that people will be more likely to look at your book if it's got, let's say, 300 reviews than if it's got 20. So I, I do try as much as I can to read reviews. If, if I don't, sorry, to leave reviews, if I don't have time to do a review, I will do a rating. And if it's if it's if I think it's below four stars, then I generally don't do it. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm. I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not. I just know that I know how hurtful it is, um, and that's not to say that I want everyone to say I love your book. I just don't want them to say they don't like love it or they hate it. Um, I don't. I don't mind constructive criticism because that helps me. So that's fine. But please say nice things too. <laughs> so there's a question here that says, does your writing brain ever switch off? Gosh, I'd like to say yes, but no, not really, not really. Um, I was reading the paper earlier on today and there was, I, 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 when I say I was reading the paper, I was reading about two weeks ago's paper because I did go away on holiday for a week and I didn't cancel the papers because you got to give them like a month's notice or something. So I just thought, ah, we'll just get them delivered. So I'm still wading through them. And there was one about some money that has disappeared from the Royal Mint. And I thought, oh, um, so, you know, no, never, no. And when I see someone um, doing something, behaving in a certain way, I think there's a character. So it, it, it doesn't. Um, and sometimes I'll have a sleepless night when I'm, either if I'm trying to tussle with a, a plot problem that I can't resolve, or um, if I'm writing really well and it's going brilliantly, and I, I've had to stop because I've written 10,000 words and I just can't think straight, but you go to bed and your mind is still buzzing. I did actually walk into a tree one day. This is absolutely true. And not the whole tree, I did see, I knew the tree was there, but I was walking along, walking the dog, thinking, I don't know why this person is in the pub. I don't know why she would be there. Of course she wouldn't go to that pub, but she has to be there, so why is she there? And I was walking along thinking about this, and the dogs were rawr, 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 kind of, so I'm not really paying attention. And I forgot that in spring, trees grow, and, and you know, sometimes branches get a bit lower, and I walked <laughs> from past this tree that I walked past before, and the next thing I, th I thought was seeing stars, and I thought, what was that? I'd walked into a branch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But I knew at that point why she was in the pub, so it was well worth it. <laughs> so as someone with a, a legendary planning process, um, what's your advice to anyone who's just starting out as an author? Right. Um, well, the first thing to say is that not everybody plans. And sometimes you have to start writing to know where you're going. So I wouldn't necessarily say you must plan or you must do it this way or, or whatever. Um, the most important thing you can do is to read widely across the genre that you would like to write in. So if you want to write romantic fiction, then um, we're probably in the wrong group, but read lots of romance writers. If you want to write crime fiction, go to Amazon and see what's selling, put crime fiction into the search box and, and find the, the writers who are, um, doing well and um, maybe I, I, I tend to buy just maybe one book from each and I'm, I'm quite I'm not Scottish so I'm a wee bit careful with the pennies so when they come down to 99p I grab them um, but I think that's fair enough because two of my books are currently 99p um, I think until the end of this month I'm not sure if they're going up after that so get them now if you want them um, and I'll, I'll read one book and I'll always learn something from it. I might not realise I've learned it, but when I come to write, I'll find that I'm thinking, oh, yes, actually, my opening scene isn't as, as gripping as um, someone else's. So read is the first thing. 
And the second thing is write. And it doesn't much matter what you write. Um, just write because it's like exercising a muscle. Um, the more you write, the better you'll get. And you might write a paragraph and then, even if you don't have an idea for a book, just write something about what happened in the supermarket or something that, that the dog did or, or you heard your neighbour over the fence. Write a little scene and play with it and then revisit that the next day and see if you can make it better. See if you can put a bit of tension into it. See if you can create a cliffhanger where one scene stops and then the next one ends. Um, and you might interpose something in between the end and the start of the next scene, just to make the reader think, wait a minute, I wanted to know about that. Um, don't think too big. Don't think, oh, you know, I'm not, a book is anything from you know 70 to 110,000 words. I don't know if I can do that. Just write and then go back to it and see what you think about it. And when you read it the next day, think to yourself, did that engage me? And if it didn't, go and read the opening scene from another book and then read the opening scene from another book. On Amazon, we've got this great gift where you can do look inside and it's frequently the opening scene of a book. So read three, four, five opening scenes and why do you like them? What is it that makes you keep, makes you keep turning the page? Go away and try and write something like that not to copy it, because we're all copying from each other. There's nothing new. We're all using tips that we see in other books. But just try small and then, then break out and break out. And um, also keep, keep an idea. I, I use my phone, but I've also got notebooks everywhere. So keep some things where you can jot your ideas down. Um, and, and don't give up. Don't give up. If there's a writer bursting to get out, it will come out. You just need to hone your craft a little bit. And reading and writing will help. I'm going to stop talking, sorry. That's all right. We've got about three minutes left. Oh, cracking. <laughs> I'm going to sneak in a quick question from Kerry Sinclair, who's been watching, because she said hello, and she said, will you have a special constable feature as a character, if oh, you that, haven't already? A really good idea, because Kerry's a special constable. Um, oh. I might do that actually. Um, I've, I've added a new character in book four, which I'll not tell you about at the moment, a new kind of semi-permanent character, um, but not a special constable. Um, I think I would have to do a bit of research. So Carrie, I'll be knocking on your door to ask you a bit about it. But yeah, that's a great idea. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. I think she'd like that because she added in brackets that she's waiting to get all of them signed from you. Oh, that's so sweet. That's so sweet. We'll, we'll have to catch up sometime soon. And then just give us a recap of all your books. Okay. Before we go. Right. So um, the first book, here we go, Squint again, See Them Run, is they're all police procedural novels. And See Them Run opens at a wedding where one of the um, uh, guests at the wedding is enticed outside by a series of salacious texts so he thinks he's going outside for a bit of a liaison and what happens is that he's actually run down by an unseen driver and then someone else in the town is also run over and the tire marks look to be the same and so there's a bit of a serial killing going on in book one that's that in plain sight i'll, I'll get the hang of this yet in plain sight is book two and this opens on the West Sands at St Andrews, which is a lovely long stretch of beach. And Claire is about to take part in a fun run. And she's also dragooned Chris into it, but Chris hasn't done any training. And they're quite excited. It's, it's to raise a bit of money for a charity. And then suddenly the cry goes up and a baby has been stolen from its pram. And they then discover that the baby has a heart condition and needs life-saving medication. And if it's not found within 48 hours, the baby could die. Then they discover, well, I'm not going to tell you what they discover. So that's book two. Book three. I'm so sorry, my camera work is grim. Book three, <laughs> Lies to Tell, um, sees Claire warned about a security breach within Police Scotland and that someone is going to come and be based in her station in St Andrews to investigate this leak, but she can't tell anybody about it. And then she has a student who goes missing. She has to try and track him down. And at the same time, she's told that um, there's a witness needing protection uh, for a high profile trial 
it's going to be based in the town as well. So she has all these balls to juggle up in the air. And she's now starting to think, what if the leak in Police Scotland is something to do with the witness protection? So she's really, you know, she's got huge, huge problems. Book four is going to be about online dating. So it's up on Amazon for pre-order, but the cover's not out yet, but it should be soon. And it will be out in February. And book five, I'm still starting to think about. So that's them. Excellent. And then all that's left for us to say is thanks so much for coming on. Oh, and I you need to come back. It's <laughs> such fun. I can't believe it's an hour, but then I do talk too much. So apologies no, fabulous. for that. But thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in. It's absolutely lovely of you. And thanks so much to you for uh, the, just the best book club ever. Um, a lovely UK crime book club. It's, it's a lovely, friendly group. And to have the chance to chat to people is just fab. So thank you. Thanks.